The History of Poland Podcast, Episode 32, Mieszko the Old. Hello and welcome back. Last time we left off with the death of Bolesław the Curly. As I mentioned, his brother Mieszko would soon take his place as the High Duke of Poland. Let's take a minute to recap the power structure in Poland before we get going. So, to start, we'll all recall that Bolesław III instituted his testament, with one of the provisions being that the eldest Piast brother would rule over the most valuable land in Poland, in addition to whatever territory they'd held up to that point. That valuable territory, which bisected all of Poland from north to south, would remain a hereditary, if that's a word. In essence, it wouldn't be passed down from father to son, but instead ruled over by whoever the eldest male Piast was alive at the time. Upon the death of Bolesław the Curly, Mieszko would begin ruling over these lands directly. In addition to Mieszko, there remains one more son of Bolesław III, Casimir. We haven't heard much about Casimir up to this point, because he was born the year that his father died. In fact, he may have even been born after his father died, never having met him even as a newborn. Up to this point in time, his life had been largely uneventful, largely because he was left out of Bolesław III's will. That is, until he was added into another will, that of his brother, Henry of Sandomierz. Separately, there were also the sons of Władysław the Exile to consider. These sons each controlled part of the Silesian lands, and were not at all happy with the status quo, or the perceived slights against their now-deceased father. Beyond the political rulers, there were also myriad religious figures across the Polish countryside, many with allegiances to one of the Piast, or in some cases sympathy towards foreign rulers. Stepping out of this mix comes Mieszko the Old. We'll pick up with Drugosz's narrative in 1174. We'll be heavily relying on Drugosz's notes for this episode, but he really does give the best summaries of events. To start, Drugosz tells us that, quote, Mieszko, Duke of Wielkopolska and Pomerania, successor to Bolesław the Curly, fails to live up to people's expectation that under his rule, they would be able to lead happy, peaceful lives. Instead, he discredits himself at the very outset of his reign with ugly acts of tyranny. The extraordinary mental maturity that, as a lad, had earned him the sobriquet, the old, seems to have deserted him on his promotion. End quote. While his mental faculties may have diminished, at least in the eyes of Drugosz, his offspring lived up to the highest of expectations. Evidently, his five sons marry into the royal lines of Hungary, into the family of Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, into the Duchy of Galicia, and various other dukes and princedoms are brought into the family fold. As for his daughters, they marry into the Bohemian, Saxon, and other ruling lines of Europe. That is quite a lot of matchmaking for Mieszko to undertake, and these relations will prove useful in the years to come. Why, you ask? Well, excellent question. It's because Mieszko was really not a great ruler. Drugoś tells us that, quote, Because of all this and his other gifts, Mieszko has been regarded as one of the most fortunate of mortals. Nonetheless, he abuses the talents given him, and it is now, yielding to the persuasion of perverse counselors, especially that of Henry of Kietlitz, his advisor and mentor in all his undertakings, that he starts exhorting tribute from his own subjects. For such a trivial offense as killing a bear, a hind, or other forest game, the prince's officials ruthlessly punish knights as well as peasants, confiscating the culprit's property, partly for the treasury and partly to fill their own pockets. When their victims' complaints reach Mieszko, he either turns a deaf ear to them or rejects them out of hand. All that concerns him is money and gifts. He becomes a greedy extortioner, cruel and vindictive, while the duchy's courts of justice and administration are all but ineffective. End quote. I don't know about you, but that sounds like some real Sheriff of Nottingham stuff right there. It's no surprise, then, that his subjects get tired of his game real quick. Not to get to Declaration of Independence on everyone, but the thing that comes to mind is when in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. According to Drugosz, such is the case. Jan tells us that, quote, Mieszko's oppression of his subjects become more and more onerous. There are endless complaints of how people have been deprived of their possessions as a result of false information laid against them. None of the prince's counselors has the courage to condemn such acts or to rebuke the prince, until the bishop of Krakow, Gideon, a man very zealous and given to plain speaking, moved by the tears of the sufferers, goes to the prince, and, after requesting the removal of all witnesses, he courageously puts forth the case of the oppressed and asks the prince to remove the taxes he has imposed, which are such as no prince before has ever inflicted on his own people, and to relieve the peasants of the illegal, unnecessary burden of having to provide cartage, and to stop the confiscation of people's property for trivial offenses, which has reduced so many to penury, 
In other words, to be a kind father to his people and not a hated tyrant. End quote. Maybe it'll work. Maybe Mieszko will listen to reason and won't pull a Rehoboam. Maybe justice will prevail, good will be done, and the people that Mieszko is responsible for will be ruled over by a benevolent duke. And if all else fails, maybe Mieszko will take a quick look around and see that Piast rulers don't tend to last long if they lose the support of not only the people, but the nobles, the church, and the rest of the Piast family. But alas, that's not what happens. Dugosh tells us that, quote, Mieszko's only response is a furious outburst in which the bishop is told that everything that Mieszko has done has been right and legal, including the new taxes and the imposition of cartage, and that without these he cannot govern the country. What earlier kings and princes have done, the bishop is told, is of no concern to the prince, who is guided by his own sense and reason, not by the example of others. The bishop is further told that, in future, he must confine himself to episcopal matters and leave secular affairs to his prince. The bishop then withdraws, a sadder man than when he came. But the bishop does not take that response lying down. Instead of quietly going back to Mieszko and complaining once more, insisting that he needs to change his ways, Gideon goes out and publicizes the whole thing. Dugos tells us all about the drama, saying, quote, Gideon, Bishop of Krakow, once again rebukes Mieszko, only this time in public. Again, this calls forth a furious outburst, the prince threatening to avenge himself on the bishop and those lords who support him by confiscating their possessions and exiling them. The laymen support the bishop and are even threatened with death or the loss of limbs, end quote. Personally, I don't know what was going through Mieszko's mind as all of this was happening. I mean, to be honest, it does seem like he's reacting to this entire situation in almost exactly the wrong way. It's like he's never considered that the harder you squeeze, the more your opposition will grow and the more it will slip through your fingers. Now, while all of this is going on, Casimir II, the Duke of Sandomirets, is building up a pretty substantial fan base. Dugosh even tells us about this, making special mention of Casimir's decision to invest in various churches, monasteries, and other pu- Dugosh even tells us about this, making special mention of Casimir's decision to invest in various churches, monasteries, and other public works projects. These projects help him find favor not only in the eyes of the people, but in the eyes of the clergy. The very clergy who are now starting to raise a fuss about Mieszko's dismal rule. Dugosh continues to narrate for us, saying that, quote, Bishop Gideon and the chief persons of Krakow secretly discuss what is to be done about Mieszko, who they see cannot be turned from tyranny. The bishop points to the dangers they and the country will face if they delay taking action, and all agree that they must get rid of Mieszko and replace him. But with whom? This proves a problem and occasions lengthy discussions, until the Vavoid of Krakow reminds them of the dangers of delay, and also that not far away is the ideal candidate, Casimir, Duke of Sandomirets, whose manner is charming and his speech grave. He has great understanding of people and is always eager to help the unfortunate. Though ready to forgive misdemeanors, he hates and severely punishes slanderers, whom he has branded with a red-hot iron on forehead, cheek or nose, their tongue mutilated, or has them blinded or flogged. He devotes all his income to the benefit of his realm. He eats and rests only as much as nature insists on his doing. Idleness he abhors, and he makes a daily necessity of taking exercise, fencing, hunting, jousting, or other nightly exercises, but that only when he has dealt with all important matters of state. End quote. Well, it looks like Casimir's favors to the church are paying off. To be fair, there's no direct evidence that I'm aware of that says that Casimir was intending for things to go this way, but let's be real, this favor he's found must not have come as much of a shock to him. Dugosh continues on, telling us that, quote, The bishop and the principal layman go from the meeting straight to Sandomirets, where, granted a private audience, they tell Casimir how, both privately and publicly, they have entreated his brother to give up acts of violence and oppression, yet to no avail. Indeed, their pleas have only earned them his enmity and threats of exile or execution. Because of this, they have come to ask Casimir to assume the powers of monarch and liberate the country, for they can no longer tolerate the rule of his brother, who acts as if he were an enemy to them and their country. In his reply, Casimir reminds them that once before he was asked to do this and refused, because he felt it wrong to displace his brother, Boleslav, who had always been so kind to him. Bishop Gideon then points out that the two cases are quite dissimilar. For Boleslav ruled in accordance with justice and the law, while Mieszko has taken to tyranny and refuses to give it up. Thus Casimir will earn enduring fame and the blessings of them all if he will come to the help of Poland and its downtrodden people. Having listened to all that they have to say, Casimir finally agrees to take over as monarch, not from any desire for power or out of envious pride, but solely for love of his country. Then, 
With a modest escort of his knights, he sets out for Krakow in the company of Bishop Gideon and the other Krakowians. Mieszko is not in his capital, but elsewhere in his duchy of Wielkopolska and Pomerania, nor does he return, but takes up residence with his wife and three sons in Raczeborch. When they reach Krakow, they are welcomed by a host of knights and nobles. Villagers come crowding in from outside, calling a welcome to one whom they regard as their country's savior. At this juncture, the expulsion of Mieszko from his duchy enables the starostas and government officials to hand over the city and castle of Krakow without difficulty or resistance. The other castles and fortresses follow Krakow's example and voluntarily submit to Casimir. So, that was a pretty bloodless coup. The clergy show up, Casimir is convinced, they take a band of knights and march on Krakow without meeting any real resistance. It reminds me a bit of a section in Andrew Roberts' Napoleon biography, specifically the part where he discusses Napoleon's return from Elba. For those not familiar, the brief summary is that after his exile to Elba, Napoleon returned to France and in essentially no time at all regained complete control of the governance of France. As with all things Napoleonic, there's controversy and disagreement, but many attribute his quick capture of power to the unpopularity of the installed monarch he was replacing. I see a lot of similarities with how quickly and relatively easily Casimir was able to assume command of Poland. Of course, it's not like Mieszko completely rolled over and gave up. Now, Dugos tells us that, quote, Duke Mieszko of Wielkopolska and Pomerania has taken his expulsion ill, and now seeks both to avenge himself on Casimir and the others who have removed him as monarch, and to get himself reinstated. His advisors are unanimous in demanding military action, and insist that on no account must he knuckle under and accept these things as they are. However, knowing that, after what he has done to the country, he can expect no help from his former subjects, he seeks the help of neighboring princes and of his sons-in-law, from whom he asks for armies. Sobislav of Bohemia replies that he has a war of his own on his hands, and the dukes of Saxony and Lorraine also excuse themselves by saying that they have already sent their armies to the emperor in Italy, who is now asking for further help for a war to recover the Holy Land. End quote. I love that response. You can put all your chips in dynastic planning and marriages with strong allies, but sometimes they'll just respond by saying, sorry, my armies are elsewhere. It's kind of like sending a text, seeing the read receipt turned on, and getting a response days later saying, oh, my bad, didn't see that. Mieszko didn't give up, though. Unfortunately, while he was busy figuring out how to manage the affairs of his descendants, he overlooked one of his sons, Odan. Odan, which is also sometimes written out as Otto, is upset that Mieszko is favoring his offspring by his second marriage and learns that he isn't going to get the ripe inheritance that he feels is his. Odan raises a rebellion against his father and marches to war. Drugosh tells us the fallout of this family dynamic, saying, quote, Choosing a favorable moment, the conspirators occupy Mieszko's castles and forts in Wielkopolska and eject Mieszko from his capital. Odan then sends emissaries to Casimir to promise complete obedience and collaboration, and putting all his castles, fortresses, and soldiers at his disposal. Casimir takes only Gniezno and its surroundings for himself, and this he does because of its former luster and fame. All the rest of Mieszko's holdings he places in Odan's hands, but both parts of Pomerania, which were obedient to Mieszko, submit directly to Casimir. In view of their distance from the capital, Casimir appoints Bugoslav, governor of western Pomerania, formerly called Slupsk, and places eastern Pomerania, his principal city is Gdansk, under Baron Sambor. End quote. Of course, this isn't all of Poland. While Casimir is by far the most powerful Piast at the moment, he isn't without challengers. Namely, the sons of Władysław the Exile, who I see as sort of like the distant cousins who are invited to weddings, but nobody really expects to show up. Well, they show up to this story, and they side with Casimir. That leaves Mieszko with very little political maneuvering room. So little that he's apparently living on the generosity of others at this point. Drugos tells us that, quote, Mieszko the Old, ousted by his son Odan, has taken refuge in Rachiborch, a town which belongs to him, and is living there with his wife and their three sons in dire poverty. End quote. And that's where we're going to stop for now. This won't be the end of Mieszko the Old, but it's as good a point to stop as any. We'll pick up next time with some more Piast family fallout. As always, if you like the show, you can support the creation of it by donating via Patreon. To do that, you can go to patreon.com slash history of Poland podcast. You'll get some nice benefits as well, which you can find out about on the page. And if you don't have the change to spare, but still want to support the show, you can share it with your friends, you can leave a review on Apple Podcasts, or you can send me a note on Twitter, Facebook, or via email. Until next time. Thank you.